put in practice, I thought I will dwell on the recent experience of the reform uh, of the conference on the future of Europe. The conference was undoubtedly an innovative attempt to deal with the crisis, even serious one that the EU has had to face over the past decade. It was characterized by democratic participation. The search for suitable solutions to uh, relaunch the uh, European integration process uh, took place with the involvement of various components of civil society, giving citizens the opportunity to be protagonists. Many solutions have been proposed, including an increase in the EU competence and the overcoming of un unanimity voting, which has often been a major limitation for the EU action due to the profound differences at the, in the vision and the interest of the 27 member states. There are many vantage points from which one can approach the analysis of this initiative. I would like to focus on the follow-up, which should perhaps lead to a revision of the treaties. But the impasse that has arisen in connection with the process of treaty reform seems a further confirmation of the difficulties in which the union finds itself. So, before having uh, a look to the follow-up, I would like to introduce the topic of the conference on the future of the European Union. Maybe uh, not everybody is aware of this initiative. So the proposal to convene a conference on the future of the European Union was put forward by President Macron, who in March 2019, just a few weeks before the election for the renewal of the Euro European Parliament and the then expected withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the EU, addressed citizens directly in an open letter drafted in all official EU languages and published on the Elysee website under the title for European Renewal. The plan for the conference was endorsed by Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, in her political guidelines presented to the European Parliament in summer 2019, and was incorporated in the European Council conclusion of December 2019. The European Parliament supported the initiative and passed several resolutions that progressively defined its position on it. The Conference on the Future of Europe, which was scheduled to start in early 20. 20 was postponed to due to the serious health situation caused by the pandemic. However, political difficulties on the governance of the conference had become apparent that would have presumably postponed its start in any case, which was the issue. The Council of the EU wished the conference could be placed under the authority of an eminent and independent European personality to act as its single chair and to be selected by mutual agreement of the three institutions. The European Parliament invoked a leadership role for a member of the Parliament in the Executive Coordination Board. The three institutions, in addition, struggled to agree during autumn 2020 on the name of a person who could preside over the conference process. So crucial in overcoming the deadlock was the compromise reached in the core repair in February 20, uh, 2021, according to which the conference will be chaired by the presidents of the three institutions. So in March 21, the, pre the, the three presidents of the three institutions uh, signed a joint declaration on the conference formally titled engaging with citizens for democracy building a more resilient Europe. The conference on the future of Europe was officially and symbolically opened on 9 May 21, which is Europe Day, the date making, marking the anniversary of the historic Schumann Declaration 
and came to a close on 9 May 22, just one year after. The conference, with the participation of the institution, the member states, civil society, had the task of drawing up a recommendation for the European Council. The future revision of the treaties was not ruled out in principle, although it was not a primary objective. The letters sent by President Macron emphasized the desire of citizens everywhere to be part of the change and called for the conference to be convened in order to propose all the changes that will, that will be needed for a political project with an open mind, even to amending the treaties. However, the joint declaration, which was the result of a compromise, states the intention to reflect on our union, the challenges we are facing and the future we want to build together, qualifying the conference as a joint undertaking, but there is no mention at all of an outcome consisting in the revision of the treaties, although the three institutions expressly committed themselves to listen to Europeans and to follow up on the recommendation made by the conference. As it has been asserted, the historical rationale for the conference on the future of Europe is the revitalization of EU constitutionalism. The conference on the future of Europe was actually designed to relaunch the project of European integration after a decade of crisis. And in this regard, it is evocative of two precedents, the conference of Messina, which in 55, constituted the first meeting of the foreign minister of the six founding members after the failure of the European Defense Community and the related European Political Community project due to a negative war in the French Assemblée Nationale, and the Convention on the Future of Europe, which at the beginning of this millennium prepared the draft treaty establishing a constitution for Europe. Both played a key role in prior moments of the EU history in relaunching the project of European integration at difficult times. In the past decade, the EU has experienced several crises, particularly the Euro crisis, the migration crisis, and the rule of law crisis, all severely challenging the unity of the EU and testing the achievements of the integration process. To this were added the shortcomings brought to light by the pandemic crisis such as the separation of health and public health policy. So the reference framework for the conference is the participatory dimension of European democracy under Article 11 of the Treaty of the European Union. The rules of procedure of the conference under Article 1 state the conference is a bottom-up citizen-centered process enabling Europeans to express their view on what they expect from the European Union. This was done via an innovative multilingual digital platform where any European could share ideas and both national and European citizen panel. The platform constituted the broadest level in terms of potential participation, not limited to individual private citizens, but open to all civil society bodies, stakeholders, European, national, regional, public authorities. For the first time in the union history, hundreds of thousands of citizens, civil society associations, and representatives of local, national, and European institutions participated in a shared reflection on the future of integration. The dialogue between Europeans was developed on several levels. The digital platform, which made it possible to collect ideas and proposals from all over the European Union and to promote the organization of thematic events on the ground and online. Four panels of European citizens, each composed of 200 uh, people randomly selected, who debated on the crucial issues of the conference. The number of participants was intended to assure diversity and representation. The rule of procedure of the conference specified the need to ensure gender balance from each member state and the representations of citizens on the basis of five criteria, nationality, urban or rural background, socioeconomic background, age and gender. 
one third of the members of each panel had to be citizens under the age of 25. At the third level, plenary session composed of members of the European Parliament and national parliaments, as well as a representative of citizen network, the Committee of the Regions and the Economic and Social Committee. They met regularly in Strasbourg. And finally, the executive committee was at the fourth level of the conference and consisted of an equal number of representatives, three from the European Parliament, the Council and the European Commission and institutional observers, observers up to four, who had the task of drafting and publishing the conclusions of the plenary and presenting the final outcome of the conference in a report sent to the joint presidency and published on the platform. Uh, which were the topics that were discussed during the conference? The joint declaration stated the intention to give citizens a say on what matters to them and identified some crucial issues reflecting the strategic agenda of the European Council for the years 99-24, the political guidelines of the European Commission and the challenges brought about by the COVID pandemic. In practice, the discussions covered nine topics, climate change and the environment, health, a stronger economy, social justice and jobs, EU in the world, values and rights, rule of law, security, digital transformation, European democracy, migration, education, culture, youth and sport. What was the outcome? The outcomes of the debate were compiled in a final report by the co-chairs of the conference executive board. 49 detailed, pro detailed proposals consisting of more than 320 concrete measures for reforming European policy and the functioning of the union itself were handed over to the presidents of the European Parliament, the Council and the Commission. Approximately 17,000 ideas were discussed and more than 6,000 events were organized across Europe involving some 650,000 people. This is certainly a remarkable achievement. Furthermore, so as it, it is the first time ever that such a project had been tried out. So this to give you an overview of the initiative. Now, the, the focus of my uh, reflection in relation to the treaty reform. So, so what? <laughs> what to do with the final report and the proposal? In mid-June, the Commission published a communication presenting an assessment of what will be needed to follow up on the proposals, thus giving an overview of the following steps and setting out how best to learn the lessons from the conference and embed participative democracy into the EU policy and lawmaking. It's important to note that in early June, on 9 June, the European Parliament, the European Parliament from the very beginning of the process of convening the conference had been in favor of including the possible revision of the treaties in the mandate. So on 9 June, the European Parliament adopted a resolution proposing amendments to the treaties under the ordinary revision procedure. In particular, the European Parliament put forward revisions that would abolish the member states' veto powers in most areas and increase European integration in health, energy, defense, and social and economic policies. And to this purpose, it called on head of state or government to set up a convention to revise the treaties. EU Parliament President Roberta Metzola brought to the Council President presidency twice in June, asking the council to proceed. Why? Because under article 48 of the treaty, 
on the European Union, the treaties may be amended in accordance with either an ordinary revi revision procedure or simplified revision procedure. So the, the Parliament asked the Council to proceed with the ordinary revision procedure. According to this procedure, the government of any member state, the European Parliament or the Commission may propose amendments to the treaties. The current uh, provision in force with more political than legal value has stated under the Treaty of Lisbon that this proposal may inter alia serve either to increase or to reduce the competences conferred on the Union in the treaties. This is of more political than legal value since an international law, of course, member states will be able to revise in any case the treaties. Uh, this proposal should be submitted to the European Council by the Council. So the role of the Council is crucial in uh, taking note of the request submitted either by the European Parliament or the Commission or any of the member states. The Council has to present the proposal to the European Council and the national parliaments are involved since they shall be notified. The revision will require the convening of a convention recommending amendments to an intergovernmental conference. In practice, if the European Council, after consulting the European Parliament mm -hmm. and the Commission, adopts by a simple majority a decision in favor of examining the proposed amendments, the President of the European Council shall convene a convention composed of representative of the national parliaments, of the heads of state or government of the member states, of the European Parliament and the Commission. The European Central Bank shall also be consulted in the case of institutional changes in the monetary area. The Convention shall examine the proposal for amendments and shall adopt by consensus a recommendation to a conference of representatives of the government of the member states that shall be convened by the President of the Council for the purpose of determining by common accord the amendment to be made to the treaties. The amendments shall enter into force after being ratified by all the member states in accordance with their respective constitutional requirements. The European Council may, however, decide by a simple majority after obtaining the consent of the European Parliament not to convene a convention, should this not be justified by the extent of the proposed amendments. In the latter case, the European Council should define the terms of reference for a conference of representatives of the governments of the member states. However, none of this has happened to date. The European Council, at its meeting on 23-24 June, merely took note of the proposal set out in the final report and stated the need for the report to be followed up informing the public without in any way referring to a possible revisions of the treaty. Instead, the point was explicitly addressed by the President of the European Commission in her annual State of Europe address of 14 September. On that occasion, she backed a constitutional convention <laughs> to reform EU treaties, stating we have to be serious about reform. So, as this parliament has called for, I believe the moment has arrived for a European convention. So we basically have two of the institutions who that have the power to request a revisions of the treaty. One has explicitly called for a revision through a resolution. The other one has backed this resolution but nothing has happened. Why? <laughs> because the council and basically the member states are opposing the reform. In fact, it should be noted that hesitant, if not explicitly hostile position to a treaty amendment expressed by several member states. One third of the member states 
published a non-paper before the start of the conference in which they expressed their opposition to a change in the treaties. The position was reiterated in a paper distributed on the day the conference ended. So 12 member states and 13 member states before and on the final day of the conference distributed a paper stating we don't want any change in the treaties. Behind such animosity lies above all the concern that the generalized application of qualified majority voting, which makes the agreement of 15 member states sufficient, could result in a hegemony of the larger states, and in particular France and Germany, to the detriment of the smaller states. This position seems to have found support in the Council General Secretariat, which published an initial opinion in June. This is stated, it is very preliminary, that the General Secretariat, after examining proposal in the final report, concluded that a significant number of proposals and related measures are in the process or being addressed or are already addressed by the EU institution. Where the proposal and related specific measure could be further addressed by the EU institution, this could be done for a large majority of cases within the current treaty framework. And only a very limited number of specific measures would require treaty change in order to be fully implemented. A different position was expressed by five founding states. So France at that time chaired the council, so it did not express explicitly in a paper the position, but the position had already been expressed by President Macron, who had the idea of the conference. Together with Spain, they published their own non-paper in which they argue for reforms, including the option of treaty change. The topic was not even addressed by the recently held European Council last week on 20 and 21st of October. Actually, the Council has not submitted the proposal to the European Council nor notified national parliaments. Not surprisingly, the General Affairs Council, who was held just a few days before on the 18, stated that taking into account that the European Parliament has asked its Committee on Constitutional Affairs to prepare proposal for further treaty amendments to implement the results of the conference, the General Council agreed that in order to ensure procedural efficiency and avoid duplication of processes, it will be appropriate to wait until the Parliament has concluded this work before transmitting the two specific proposals already received. In this context, so during the meeting, many ministers noted that the vast majority of the conference proposal can be implemented under the current treaty framework and took the view that this proposal should be given priority at this stage. The Minister of European Affairs of the Czech Republic, this is important since the Czech Republic is chairing the Council currently, expressly stated that 95% of the measures can be implemented using the full potential of the current treaties. In addition, some ministers felt that in the context of the urgent challenges resulting from Russia's war in Ukraine, it was important to focus all energy on delivering solution to the practical problems facing European citizens. Others considered that more time was needed for a comprehensive assessment before engaging in the process of the treaty change. What to expect then? Article 48 of the Treaty of the European Union does not seem to envisage a margin of discretion for the Council, since it simply provides that the Council shall have to submit a proposal made by one of the three 
entities that are uh, entitled to do so to the European Council. There are no precedents to refer to, and therefore one can only envisage possible solution in the light of EU law, recalling first of all, the obligation of loyal cooperation that the institutions are bound to implement among themselves, portion to Article 13, paragraph two of the treaty. Therefore, it will be advisable for the Council to follow up within a reason, reasonable time. There is no time limit stated under Article 48. So to uh, submit the request made by the Parliament and supported by the Commission. Someone has speculated on the initiation of an action for failure to act by the Court of Justice. This could perhaps be an avenue from a legal perspective, less so from a political point of view. <laughs> Certainly a conflict between institutions evidently revealing a deep rift between member states is not what the union needs as such a delicate time on the international scene and of likely severe economic recession when the union needs to present itself as united and cohesive. So I, I thought this was an interesting uh, case study <laughs> to uh, reflect on the scope of Article 48 and the possibility to revise the treaty. We have an opportunity in front of us based on many proposals that have been, uh, that are contained in a final report that has been drafted through very participatory process. However, this shows that uh, this is not easy to do since the differences among member states in practice prevent the application of this provision. So we will follow up, <laughs> we will see how it, uh, this uh, situation ends. But despite the provisions in the treaty, in practice, <laughs> it's not easy to proceed. So. Really, thank you so much, Professoressa <laughs> Professor, uh, Pascale.